I never really know how to start these things. Uh, <laughs> hi, everybody on YouTube. It's good to see you again. It's been a while. And today I want to talk to you about something very important. So we talk about the foundation of society being the family unit. And I've had a couple of interesting conversations with people that the family unit uh, is often referred to as the nuclear family. Now, I'm from Asia. My family's from Asia, right? So a nuclear family is not really what we do. Uh, we do large extended families, and these families are very involved. Uh, I'll give you some personal anecdotes when the thing is over, but uh, I decided to put my engineering hat on, and I did a network analysis of the nuclear family versus other family architectures, a little bit like you do a, a network analysis of like a Wi-Fi mesh network or something, or or even just a, a social media uh, network, right? However many connections makes it stronger. We'll talk about it, but I want to start off here by doing a little bit about the nuclear family. Uh, I used a slightly more derogatory uh, subtitle. It was the blankiest other thing we ever did. I changed the silliest at my wife's suggestion. Um, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to keep things light. It's so easy to be angry on the internet, but it's really just not necessary. But we're going to talk about the nuclear family today, and we're going to find out maybe why some of our ills are the way they are. But one thing that was very surprising to me was. The answer to the question of, are we building our society on sand, on shaky ground? And I found mathematically that, uh, well, it's very surprising. All right. Oh, whoops. New to the software. I'm, I'm only just back on the horse. Okay. We're going to do a quick rundown now. Uh, nuclear family myths and misconceptions. Myths and misconceptions. Well, I should put that in my vocal exercises. Myths and misconceptions. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the family as a network strength analysis. Uh, then we're going to do a holistic analysis. Uh, don't worry, it's not like woo-woo crystals. I'm going to look beyond just the arrows and, and the connections in the network. And we're going to talk about some you know, real-life stuff and what those diagrams actually mean. Uh, then we're going to talk about how Western families fall apart. That should be pretty exciting. And then how do we fix it? Because I wouldn't be an engineer if I didn't not just point out a problem, because we'd love to point out problems, but also to point out some possible solutions. So hopefully this will make your family stronger and make the world make a little bit more sense to you. Let's go into it. So first, myths and misconceptions is, is the nuclear family traditional? That's I think, is a myth. And we're going to, that's disprovable very quickly. Uh, first off, I was being a little facetious here. I said, are you serious? You really thought that? Nuclear family is traditional, huh? Uh, second one is, it's better for kids, which I don't believe it is. And finally, the nuclear family, you know, is it strong? And if it was strong, then we wouldn't have to defend it. You know, if I, we wouldn't have to, it would defend itself fairly well as a social structure. Most social structures that are resilient are strong are also resilient. So why is the nuclear family crumbling? Um, and yet it is strong. It's obviously not. But we're going to talk about why it's not strong. I hope you guys like my pink cursor here. It's actually because I got a 4K monitor. That's like 39 inches, and I lose my cursor all the time, so I had to make it, I had to make it pink. Uh, anyways, so the nuclear family is sourced back uh, from a first mention in Merriam-Webster in 1924. So that's 100 years. Woo, 100 years. The nuclear family is a 100-year-old concept. Uh, and uh, next year, if you're English, uh, <laughs> then you get to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the nuclear family being mentioned because that was when it was mentioned in the Oxford Dictionary. So... And the definition uh, is right here on the right, a family group that consists only of parents and children. That specifically excludes extended family. So I think you can see why I take issue with the uh, label that nuclear families are traditional. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, nucleus you know, actually comes from the Greek word for nut, which means the most fundamental unit thereof, which is why the nucleus of a cell or the nucleus of an atom or the nucleus of a family is the parents and child. Now, I do believe the parents and children are the nucleus of the family, but that is not a going bare minimum is not the best structure. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, first off, myth. Nuclear families are traditional. Uh, that coin was that term was coined uh, 100 years ago. Right. As we've mentioned. But it was only popularized the 1960s and 1970s. I mean, there's some cars on the road right now that you can go to a car show and you'll see that are older than the nuclear family has been popular for. Right. <laughs> From like 1950s. OK. Uh, I want to point out that the nuclear family is a modern 
invention, not because it's some improvement, but because it was possible. Uh, society had proved, improved around us. So you could have one income, typically the father, take care of an entire family, buy a house, buy a car, maybe even buy two cars, buy, buy a TV, and then eventually a color TV. And that was enough for families. Like they had enough and they were okay with that. Uh, they also had a lot of support structure. We'll, we'll talk about how the nuclear family survived all these modern times towards the end, because we can learn a lot about what we need to make modern families, which are less and less nuclear, survive in the future. Um, of course, the American nuclear family is kind of the quintessential one. Everyone thinks 1950s. They never say 1960s. <laughs> They'll say 1950s family. They won't say 1960s family for a reason, you know. They don't say 1940s family either, right? They say 1950s, a glorious decade of the nuclear family. Uh, and ever since then, it's actually been in decline. Now, first off, the myth, it's better for children. I mean, your mileage will vary. Sometimes everyone has, like, the weird uncle or the weird aunt or the weird grandparents. I'm not talking about those. Those are, those are supposed to be exceptional. I hope that those are exceptional. Most of the time, more people involved in your child's life that are blood relations of yours or even, you know, in-laws or steps or whatever. People who work well, it's good to have more support if everyone's working well. So the assumption here is that everyone's working well, and that means the more connections, the merrier, all right? This is not about how to make a better family. It's how to create a better family structure because how to make a better family is a very involved discussion. And that would take a while. So, uh, Now, nuclear families are strong. I did jump the gun on this one a little bit, is that, you know, the, the normal Western issues that families have is not normal. Like, it's not normal for parents to be that stressed. Like, I know Asians who work two jobs or, or like, run a, a laundromat or a restaurant, and they have, like, four or five kids. And they're not nearly as stressed as, as Western families are. And I think it's just because of the uncertainty. Like if you work really hard, you go into that Chinese restaurant at six in the morning and you leave at like nine at night, you, you know, and your wife's at home and she's taking care of the four or five kids and you've got your extended family helping you out because that's what you do when you're an immigrant. And your extended family is not just relations. We'll talk more about that later. You feel like you have more support. There's more consistency. And like, like with not saying that I'm going to compare this to PTSD, but the reason why PTSD arises is not because of the intensity of the combat, but because it comes at random times unexpectedly you're, you're always and therefore you're always expecting something um you'll get more trauma from like a very light punishment that's given to you randomly than you would a heaven heavy punishment that's given to you when you've done a certain action right anyways the inconsistency i think creates a lot of stress uh teenage rebellion is not normal in the rest of the world it's it's purely a western thing uh lots of suicide mental health issues is not typically normal except in the most extreme uh, other countries uh, who who are going hard at it. Um, that's and they have their own individual issues, but like the the West has this one structural issue with suicide that I don't understand. And maybe we'll get into that someday. But um, I don't want to talk too much about that. I, I realize that YouTube's going to get mad at me. I'm sorry. I do not endorse. Please don't do that. Uh, okay. Now let's do the network analysis. Okay. So the network analysis uh, goes like this. I'm not going to talk about the strength of the beams itself, right? Like the strength of this beam or that beam. I'm only going to talk about the structure of these um, families. A little bit like you talk about the structure of a truss. Now, you could have a beam bridge that's made out of titanium, you know, meteoric alloys, and a truss that's made out of tissue paper. And of course, the beam in that case is stronger than the truss. But that's not what we're talking about. We're just going to talk about the structure of the family and not the strength of an individual member that can vary or... Um, individual skills. I'm just talking about the structure. And generally speaking, the more connections you have, the stronger you're going to be in your family. Uh, these sort of social weaknesses can make your family dissolve. But if you have enough uh, social connections in your family, it can help it stay a lot better. Because let's say you have a teenage teenager who's rebelling, right? I don't want to go to law school, dad. I want to be a musician. And your uncle's a musician. Or, or like Moonlights as a musician at the club after his lawyer job, right? <laughs> um, you kind of have someone for that kid to look up to, and they don't leave the family. They just associate more with the uncle than with their own dad, which is totally normal um, in the rest of the world. People kind of pick their favorites in the family, and that keeps them in the family rather than going out to wherever and just dissolving into society. Like uh, Families with strong structures do not worry too much about society. 
except for like the price of gas or something, right? <laughs> but anyways, in this uh, analysis, there's a couple of things I'm going to use to gauge if something is strong, okay? Now, here you start with just the supporter child relationship. Uh, I'm covering the stress support a little bit. This is a stress supporter. A stress supporter has a whole lot of people that they have to take care of, and it's all going outward, right? A healthy supporter has about equal support uh, given to them as support going out because these supporters can help you. These supporters can also help you with the other kids, that sort of thing. Uh, now, a fragile supporter is someone who has only one backup, right? So we got healthy, stressed, and fragile. I don't worry too much about coddled because coddled is when there's like a lot of support going into one node, and that typically only happens with the youngest child. So we'll uh, not worry about that. But support is what I'm going to use to refer to someone who's giving, uh, you know, the arrows the or originating from, you know, who's giving the help, and whoever's on the receiving end of that. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, whoever's getting help into them, that's support. And when the help is going out of you, like support's coming out of you, that's called obligation. All right. Now, <clears throat> this analysis has some caveats. Obviously, support is a loaded term. What does that even mean? We're going to talk about it in the holistic analysis. I'm just doing a network analysis to see how involved and structurally sound the family structure itself is, right? Now, the extent is also determined by ability and timing, right? So you might have a rock star nanny aunt who is, she just loves taking care of kids, but, you know, she's got jury duty this week, so the timing can also come in, right? Uh, it's a little bit like insurance. Everyone sort of pays into it, but everyone has a disaster once in a while or something they need to attend to once in a while. Uh, and that's why these structures need to be more intermingled and you need to have lots of connections because that spreads the risk. Uh, now, I have a, the assumption I have is that all these family members are competent. If you have an incompetent family member, and that's maybe not you know, a fault of their own, they might be disabled or um, uh, have other issues. They'll make them unable to support. My assumption here is that everyone's up to snuff most of the time. Uh, and I'm only going to talk about uh, the nuclear family you know, as the core because there'd be just arrows everywhere if I showed how the father also supports the grandparents and all that stuff. But basically all this to say that the family structure facilitates success, but it doesn't guarantee it. Uh, your mileage will vary. Okay. Now let's talk about the nuclear family. Uh, the nuclear family, as we all know, is mother, father, children, as per the Merriam-Webster defi uh, definition, okay? Uh, in here, you see the mother is giving support to the father and all four children. The number of children uh, can change, right? Most families don't have four children. Uh, the father is giving help to the mother and all four children. And you can actually do a little, little tally up here, right? So the tally up is that inbound support for the mom is only one. Inbound support for the dad is only one. And inbound support for the children goes two, three, four, five, you know, two being both parents for the oldest child. And in here, I uh, assume because the members are competent that the oldest children can actually help the younger one, right? And we're going to talk about what kind of help and what kind of support that is, because children actually can play, a, a, children can and do play a vital role in the support of their younger siblings, uh, at least in a functional family they do. Um, but here we can see that the parents are both uh, fragile and stressed, right? As I showed here, it's a one to five uh, ratio of support these parents have. And the parents only have each other. So if something happens, it's catastrophic, right? Now, like what happens if both parents work or something, right? Or what happens if uh, one of them becomes disabled, breaks a leg or just gets sick? And then they have this pile of dishes out there. They have tons of work. They have to do tons of catch up. And it turns into a massive downward spiral. And I've seen families go into the spiral and they sometimes never get out. Um, they think of like a vacation is going to fix it. I mean, it'll help temporarily maybe, but vacations can also be very stressful and it doesn't fix the underlying issue is that you have very fragile uh, support for each parent. So we're going to talk about the multi-generational slash tall family next. Now, the tall family has the grandparents involved and you can see mathematically what happens. You now have a one-to-one -one ratio of support if you have both maternal and paternal grandparents present. OK, um, now, if you have a young family like the mother and father are in their 20s and you have your kids, that means the grandparents are in their in their 40s or 50s, you know, depending on their size of their family. Right. 40s and 50s is not bad. That's that's pretty spry, actually. Um, even even in the 60s, they can do mo a lot of things. But if they're in their 40s or 50s, that means they're basically parent part two. I mean, some people wait until their 40s to have their first round of children. Um, yeah, they, basically, these, these grandparents come in and help. They provide a lot of special support, 
because these grandparents are experienced, uh, they're also dedicated. Like they have nowhere else to go. <laughs> if they, especially if they live in that same house, they're there every day. Uh, and they, they're retired or, well, if they're in their forties and fifties, they're not, but they have a lighter load, right? They're not working quite so much. They can typically help more. And they're also familiar with your parenting style because uh, they pass their parenting style on to you and they should know. Now, in the case of the boomers, I'm going to talk about this very late in the, um, in the you know, presentation about why this kind of doesn't work for Americans, but that's purely a cultural thing that's kind of on you guys. I'm telling you this not to have you fix the past. I want you to fix the future. And that means to keep this stuff in mind as you're coming up in your years and you're having kids and grandkids. All right. Now, this is also neither fragile nor stressed. Uh, and now, unfortunately, having your own parents live with you while you raise your own kids does involve some surrender of autonomy. Uh, they're going to tell you that they like to put the dishes in here. You know, it's parents. They're going to do what they're going to do. You're, you're no longer the boss of your own house. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people left this model when they could. Right now. <clears throat> now we have the extended slash wide family analysis. All right. So. The extended slash wide family analysis is aunts, uncles, cousins, but you could substitute the word aunts and uncles with like really good friends. Like if you have really good friends and their kids, but essentially what it means is that you have more peer support, not support coming from above, you know, your, your grandparents, uh, you have more peer support and this, um, <clears throat> network can have any number of aunts and uncles who can switch out all the time. So although the support is no longer as dedicated, the support is a lot easier to come by and can be transient. Like for a couple of years, you might be really good friends with your neighbors or something like that. And you guys kind of co-parent together because you just all mesh really well. But then they move away and then you get new neighbors who aren't quite so good with, the, you know, that. So you end up, you know, working with your brother and sister or someone from church. Uh, but the cool thing is, is that the children get a peer group. And that's a really important. We're going to talk about that in the holistic analysis. Now, this is not fragile, nor is it stressed. It's a little bit less dedicated. Um, well, it's a lot less dedicated because everyone has their own family, right? <laughs> but it normalizes risk rather than reduce it, right? So what I mean normalizing, that means you spread out the risk. So if one mom gets the flu, the other, you know, the aunt can jump in and help out, right? Uh, it's not like you've lost all support. It's just you've lost a bit of support. So you've spread yourself kind of out on the ice. Uh, the benefit of the peer group dynamic, though, is that adults get other adults uh, to help them with the same issues they're having. And the children can be socialized by their children. So like playing is a big part of socialization. If you've ever had a kid and it's just you and the kid and you have to socialize them, it is absolute doldrums. It is boring because they just, you know, they want to play peekaboo for four hours straight <laughs> and then pass out for 15 minutes, then wake up and watch, you know, Paw Patrol for three hours. It's, it's really bad. Now, if you have another kid <laughs> who can share that experience with them, then they get some socialization, but you don't have to be there all the time. Um, now, this does not have to be aunts or uncles. It can be good friends, like I mentioned. Okay, let's go to the conclusion of this network analysis. Uh, the overall conclusion here is that the nuclear family is bare minimum compared to an extended family. Uh, it is fragile and stressed far more. Uh, but when things are good, it requires a lot less effort because you don't have support coming out of you, right? It's when things are good, the nuclear family is good. Now, when things get bad, uh, this, it is not good. Okay. It becomes very fragile, becomes very stressed. Everyone becomes very resentful. Uh, the multi-generational extended families are more work overall, but they distribute the stress. Okay. Now beyond the numbers, we're going to do a little holistic look at the family. What kind of support do different family members need? What are the arrows exactly? Uh, what do different roles do? Uh, is support or obligation universal? And how does time play a factor in this? Okay. So First off, the type of roles that you typically have in a family is caretaker. They see to the material needs. Uh, playmate is someone you socially, uh, you play with to socially develop with. Uh, role model, strong, fast, smart, responsible, with a sense of place, right? Someone who you look up to, okay? Uh, counsel is someone who gives advice or comfort uh, beyond just superficial af affirmations. Like this is real counseling, like some real, you know, sitting with the coffee at 11 in the morning on a Sunday in your kitchen with your friend trying to hash through a pile of bills <laughs> or something like that, right? Trying to get your life back on track. Um, a mentor is someone who imparts skills to you, uh, skills or ways of being like, you might have a mentor who's just there to teach you how to, you know, box, breathe and reduce your stress. Uh, all really good stuff. You might also have a mentor that teaches you how to change the pipes in your 
or like put new pipe fittings in your kitchen, right? Finally, leadership is uh, pretty important. Most families do not have good leadership. It's just the dad and the dad has a million other things he has to worry about. Typically, this is the grandpa, okay? So <clears throat> the leader kind of mediates, mediates disputes in, within the family, but also sets the family's direction. So a leader would be the kind of person in the family that might say, hey, we're all going to move to another state. Like I moved to Tennessee and I'm slowly but surely trying to bring my family with them, my extended family. Um, so in that case, I'd be the leader. But anyways, members needs. Children need material care and socialization, as I mentioned, but they also need role models as they get a bit older. Uh, young adults need role models, mentors, counseling, leadership. Pretty much children need to be taken care of. Uh, young adults need to be guided. Uh, adults need to be supported. And, you know, older adults can do the support, but they need less. And, and then finally, like when you're old, 70 plus, you might need material care again. You know, someone to, well, do what this kid's about to get. Not not get brushed. I, I don't think brushing the <laughs> baby's hair is going to, I just, sorry, I just noticed what this, uh, what this Pexels picture shows, they're, they're, I think the boy's trying to calm the baby by brushing the non-existent hair. That's pretty funny. Maybe you just thought the baby needed to be shinier. I don't know. Uh, that's not how you calm a baby. I mean, if it is, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not an expert with babies. Um, <laughs> speaking of babies, this is the things that the members can serve with, right? So as I said, children can help socialize each other with a bit of intervention, right? Go play some stick ball. Okay, someone hit somebody else with a ball. Now a parent actually has to come out and mediate the dispute. Now the kids now know the rules of how to mediate disputes of accidents or purposeful uh, stickball injuries. Uh, <laughs> uh, you got your uh, material care for ages eight plus. Uh, when I was eight years old, I taught my sister how to, like I used to make food for my sister and I taught her how to make ramen, all that good stuff. Uh, basic Asian family skills. Uh, a young adult, as you get, as you get up, or up the, uh, up in age, you become able to materially provide for other people and your responsibilities start to stack, okay? Now, right here, this adult tier two, look at all these different roles. Like, do you want to be that for your whole family? You have to be that for every member of your family. It just doesn't happen. Like, you can't socialize your daughter and materially care for her and counselor and role model her and mentor and leader unless you're like amazing dad or you two just like really click. Typically, there's some disconnect there, whether it's personality, interest or just they just spend way too much time with you and they want to try being with somebody else right so that's a lot of that's a lot to ask of a single person you'll find that in large families uh people tend to specialize like here in this bottom right uh picture i showed this because it shows two young adults working out together like doing yoga and stretches hey that's great um people can help each other right so the nature of support is, as I mentioned before, it's like insurance. It smooths out and spreads out rith, uh, risks of rough times. But there's ways that you can, uh, what, how you can say, really maneuver and game the family. So as I said before, children can do the majority of socialization, especially if you work with the oldest child and they kind of set the rules because that oldest child is going to be parent number three uh, for your family. Uh, parents focus on guidance and material care. Uh, you can have a, an aunt that's a great role, like, excellent counsel and an uncle that's a great role model. As I was saying before, you don't have to be all things to all people. That's a lot of stress and that's too much. And that's the source, I think, of teenage rebellion is that parents just cannot be all things to their children. So the, the children will get disappointed and go looking elsewhere. They'll go looking at people in their neighborhood for, for good or for bad. And as society degrades, that's going to become more bad than it becomes more good. All right. Also, everyone just needs a break. Uh, she's living her best life right here. <laughs> She's not, she's not worrying about kids coming in. Like people need this mesh support systems, allow people some freedom. It's more obligation, but paradoxically, it's more freedom. Uh, like I picked this picture of this young lady manning this booth because she might be here just for this Asian festival to sell goods. And that's what she looks forward to all year. It's the thing she wants to do. This is who she is. She loves doing it. She wants to make it. It doesn't have to be an Asian festival. It could be that you make art like your wife makes art and she wants to go to Comic-Con and sell that art and let people see it. And that's what gives her uh, a purpose in life. And you don't want her to give that up because she has kids because then she's gonna become resentful of the kids. She's gonna become resentful of you. If she lets slip, by the way, if your wife lets slip that she regrets having kids, even just a little bit, kids remember that. I remember every time my mom said that. And that's why young people aren't having kids is because the mom is just super stressed or the dad is super stressed and they don't treat having children like a blessing 
at some point, all the stress shows through. You cannot willpower stress away. It just doesn't work. Spread it out. That's why you're supposed to have a family. You're not supposed to. The way you cope with stress is by, you don't manage stress by managing your attitude. Uh, you manage stress by managing your network. Anyways, <laughs> that's a good segue to how Western families fall apart. Um, so nuclear families became the norm when families left their homes, their homesteads, their farms, villages, wherever they're from, right? Like my dad is from Jakarta. Okay. He left to the United States uh, because there was, you know, cities for manufacturing jobs, right? There's, there's places you can go to where you can just earn a living, as I've said before, earn a living on a single income to support a family. That kind of ended in the 90s, I think, when something happened. Uh, and also the suburbs had transportation, right? You, you had roadways and infrastructure that allowed you to live a more atomic lifestyle or more nuclear lifestyle. So with freedom of movement and economic centralization, uh, we kind of disintegrated our bonds from our homelands and we became atomized families, like these atomized nucleus, bare minimum families. The economic incentives uh, were prioritized over our family bonds, pretty much. Now, how nuclear families survive? It survived because the remnants of the world before it. So these different things, these institutions, I, I'm actually kind of becoming against institutions because they're sort of, it's like life support for the nuclear family, right? Community familiarity, which goes away more and more as people move around. Uh, good salaries and jobs, that's that comes and goes with the weather, right? Affordable housing, less so, less so, you know? We have mortgages as a, are a norm, you know? And housing prices have skyrocketed ever since the 1920s, ever since a long time. Houses used to not be that expensive, believe it or not. And that's even adjusting for inflation. Uh, public school is pretty much, people call it uh, daycare, like government daycare for your children. That's kind of true. It's kind of true because it keeps your kids out of your hair for like eight hours a day, allowing you to go to your job. Um, what if, but what if that public school doesn't function, right? What if you now have school from home or now have uh, a, a school that you're not even sure you can even go to, right? Uh, what about a high trust society? What if that goes away? Like you used to be able to just let your kids go out on a bicycle and ride to the park and do whatever they want all day. You hand them five bucks because they mowed the lawn and there they go to Taco Bell or 7-Eleven or something and they're having a great time as 80s kids. Uh, well, as a high trust society falls apart, you no longer have uh, the ability to turn your kids out onto the, onto the you know into the open world. They're they're at home for you to take care of all the time, all the time. Uh, as communities start to disintegrate, community events are spending are taking up less and less of your kids' time. Like it used to be that you had to have community events, like there'd be just a soccer pickup game that would happen. You know, see the high trust society death, you know, death as to why that doesn't happen. Pee wee sports as it gets you know. Uh, after school programs, church programs, all these programs, there used to be lots of programs for kids to go to, and, and there's fewer now, and they're very expensive. They're basically daycare prices, which are crippling. You might as well just have a dedicated person at home, but you can't afford it because there's not any good salaries and jobs. So both mom and dad have to work. It's, it's, a, it's a wreck. So nuclear families have pretty much survived because of the benefits of the world before the nuclear family, right? So what is a pre-modern extended family? Uh, I love this picture. It's beautiful. I think it's an Orthodox church, actually, now that I look at it. And there's like a Catholic church. They, I bet they have like West Side Story style, like rumbles, like the priests there. <laughs> That'd be great. And the hats versus the hats. Anyways, basically villages, right? You could just point into a crowd at the village and say, that's my third cousin twice removed. And you'd probably be right because everyone's related to each other. Everybody knows each other by like three degrees. Uh, no one is really a stranger. They're just people you haven't met. And you have this cooperative extended social structure a structure linked by distant relations. Like when you go to a town called like Harrisburg, it used to be a burg that was full of the Harris family. Like the Harris family came and founded this burg. <laughs> they populated it and their men would go out and find wives and bring them back to the Harrisburg <laughs> to make more Harrises. It was a Harris factory. But that's that's the what if you look at towns in the United States, almost all of them were family based because that was their free modern extended family. All right. So what happened was we just forgot ourselves. Like we forgot what the struggle uh, was to make a family. We forgot the temptations that dissolved the families in the first place and turned them into these nuclear atomized families. And we forgot the cost of losing our family, right? So much so that the modern concept of nuclear families seems traditional, that this is a big con. Like we were duped into thinking that a reduction of a large family structure was 
a, a reduction of the large family structure down to its most basic form, bare minimum, highest risk uh, form, like highest stress, highest fragility form was the best way to live. It's simply not like mathematically, holistically. I mean, intuitively, this is not genius level stuff, right? Like the nuclear family is a deviation from the norm. Like I'm going to say it, nuclear families are deviant. There's it's the, it's the same age as the sexual revolution around the 60s, 70s. So I don't know how uh, Western conservatives and I, I said, I'm my family's from the East, like Western conservatives have been gaslit or gaslit themselves or just willingly ignorant or they're probably just ignorant and they don't understand that they kind of keep saying that a thing is traditional when it's as traditional as a sexual revolution. Like as I, that earlier slide where I said, um, sarcastically, I put a, a little caption on this picture. It showed a nuclear family in front of a little house you know, with one car, two kids, two parents. And I said, this is the beginning of the history of beginning of history for the West is because it feels like that. Like, the one side sees the sexual revolution in the 60s, you know, a, a sexual revolution is the beginning of history for them. And the other side sees the nuclear family as the beginning of history for them. But both of them are just from the 1960s. Like there are people that are older than this. Like, this is only 60 years ago. It's crazy. I, I fell for it too. I'm not here to like judge or anything or be a jerk. I, I, that's why I was surprised. But when I just put a little bit of thinking on this. Now, I added this slide, by the way, on Boomer at the last minute because I can't talk about this without... We can't do a little bit of Boomer bashing. <laughs> we can't talk about the degradation of the family structure without doing a little bit of Boomer bashing. But uh, they left the support structure of their hometowns to go to these factory towns uh, or go pursue more wealth and less family obligation. They left those stodgy obligations. But it's bad for their children in the long run. And now boomers are just busy RVing or cruising. Like they're not really helping their children parents. They'll come over for a bit. They'll take the kids for like a week for the year. Uh, they'll, they'll basically just playmates for a little bit. Oh, all right, we're done with the kids. We spent our four hours with the kids that we do once a week. If that, you know, it's very bare minimum. But sir, there are good boomers out there. Um, my dad is from Asia, so he missed out on being a baby boomer. He was just an Asian immigrant. <laughs> and they're not lazy. So let's talk about what is good. Okay. Let's talk about now that we've gotten done, I want you to put all the boomers in the, in the past. Okay. We're not going to talk about them anymore because blaming is only half the game. Now we need to learn what we're going to do better. Okay. So strong families have support structures that do not break down because society is breaking down. Like my family doesn't worry about society at large. I don't care what the grades are at the school system near my house. I don't care about the job market at large. I don't care about even the fed rate, right? Because <laughs> You know, we're, we're in the habit now of buying houses straight cash because we help each other buy houses. Um, like my mortgage is going to be gone in four years. I, I got that 2.1% or 2.2% a few years ago. I mean, that's basically free money. So I, I got that one. But anyways, like a strong family provides services for themselves. Like imagine what your grocery bill would be is if you had a cousin that lived 10 miles away and they had a little farm, a little homestead, and they just gave you free eggs because I had eggs coming out of my ears. Like I was that guy, you know, I was him, the guy with the eggs. I'm also the guy with the meat, right? I, I, I raise livestock for slaughter. So I've just taken care of more than half your grocery bill. And, w and I've given you the best food you can have. Farm fresh eggs, like freshly slaughtered lamb, frozen, vacuum packed. You know, someone else might cook, someone else. I wish I had someone help me work on my car, right? Uh, to, to do the automotive stuff. So you can build an economy inside of your family. Like this would be my uncle. Um, in real life, right? My uncle works on cars. This would probably be my, uh, my dad's new wife. Not the most Christian thing, but he's happy. So I'm going to just get to call the first one a mulligan, right? <laughs> Anyways, uh, the strong family economy. In other words, strong families are a net contributor. So this is the, this is the weird double speak that I see with the Western conservatives is they will say that the family is the building block of society, but then they're talking about how their families are under attack because society is crumbling. Well, if you're the building block of society, then why are you worried about society crumbling? It's like, all right, like you should be a, a family should be a net contributor to society. You should be able to just branch off with your neighbors and, and create your own town that just doesn't care about the outside world. You know, you're all doing OK. Maybe you all grow mushrooms. There's one town in Pennsylvania. I forget what's called something square. And they just grow mushrooms. Some some guy got it in his head to grow mushrooms. And then the entire town does it now. And it's the and it's almost all of the mushrooms in the United States are grown in that one town. I forget what it's called. It's like Kensington Square or something like that. I, I went through. It's a beautiful town. They had like this 
almost uh, Norman Rockwell looking uh, Veterans Day parade where everybody got to go in there. There was a guy dressed as Star Wars. It was, it was the kids were having fun. Everyone was having fun. Big bands. I was like, this town was created by a strong family who decided they wanted to make their own economy and then be a net contributor outward and put their town. They kind of keep their town sort of secret. So like I just happened to go through because I was a traveling sales guy at the time. But it was the most amazing town. I, I'm I am an appreciator of strong families, as you will find. Anyways, I'm sorry. I went off a tangent. <laughs> so in a social economy, though, the support offered from the family is different. Yes. So one family might be, you know, have specialties, but that's where you start branching out and working with other families in the area. Right. There are a lot of families near here that raise cattle, but I'm, you know, I'm an engineer. I have an engineering degree. I could probably teach cal you know, up to calculus <laughs> if I dusted off my college books you know, numerical methods and all that other stuff. And then their kids would go from being cattle ranchers to being super, you know, engineers like me. And I get tons of beef. So that seems pretty fair. Uh, in this area that I'm in right now, like fin the financial collapse didn't really affect the economy very much because a lot of the people around here are local producers. So you can just, you just cycle through this. Do you think the Amish care what the Fed rate is? Probably not. Um, I mean, they'll probably see fewer customers, but they're not starving. I mean, they're not worrying about bills. I mean, obviously not their electricity bill, but, you know, <laughs> they're, they um, don't worry about the hard times because they're, they're actually the strong building block of society, a net contributor, not a net consumer. So my warning right now is that times are getting harder, not easier, and you're going to have to make a choice to change. And if you don't change, then you're just going to go wherever you're going now, right? It's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of energy to change the trajectory of the river of, that is your life. <laughs> but once you change it, you just got to follow it for the rest of the time. But if you don't change it, it's just going to go wherever it's going. So how can you fix this? Right. So you need to look at families that work. Uh, you need to start becoming a strong family appreciator like I do, like I am, right? I took... It took a lot of work uh, to make a family. It takes a lot of work to keep a family. And the cost, uh, that's the cost, right? That you're going to have to sink. The, there's a reason why people went to nuclear families. It's because they could in good times. But the good times are gone. They're, they've been gone. They're, they're going. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to start putting in that extra social maintenance uh, to keep a network going and keep a happy family that can help each other out, right? And you need to start thinking cross regional, even across the globe for your family. Okay. So what are the families, uh, what are good, what do good families have in common? These super families. Now go ahead and take some time in the comments, pause the video, go ahead and pause the video and write in the comments section, what you think uh, are the characteristics of a strong family. All right. I'm going to just wait and let you do that. Three, two, one. Now here are my thoughts. Okay. In a strong family, everyone works and plays together, even the kids, even the adults. Everyone serves a higher purpose. Um, everyone focuses on improving themselves, but not at the cost of their humanity. Now, we're going to talk more about that in a bit, but self-improvement can become like a little god that you sort of worship. It's not like that. It's like slow and steady. Every, every day, every year, I'm getting a little bit better. We're working on things, right? We're not obsessing. It's the difference between love and obsession. But anyways, everyone is capable of being vulnerable. So no, everybody needs help. Uh, the worst thing you could be in a family is a person who never asks anybody else for help because you are one disaster away from just crumbling, okay? You need a strong network. That's what makes strong men. That's what makes strong women. That's what makes strong families. A lot of connections. That means vulnerability. Hey, I need your help with this. You don't have, and you don't have to... Uh, you know, do a quid pro quo. It's not transactional. You just say, hey, I need your help. And they'll call you for help sometime when they need it. All right. And they're going to be vulnerable with you. They're going to follow your example of being vulnerable. Um, and these families have extended families. It's not just a nuclear family. Now, let's talk about putting everyone to work. Now, I mentioned that children can help uh, with socialization, but they can do a lot more. Most adults are pretty interchangeable. Every, like, it only takes one adult and a van to drive everybody's kids to soccer practice. Right. <laughs> so you only need, you know, all the, all the adults are kind of interchangeable, but with the children, what you can do is you can bring their responsibilities up over and over. And I looked all over on the internet for this. There's a picture of an Inuit child 
uh, using a knife to cut up whale blubber, and the knife is like razor sharp. And the kid's probably like four or five years old, right? That's his crafts project. You know, that's his finger paints. <laughs> Pretty much they put him to work. It was, used to be normal that children worked. Now we talk about child labor, but child labor in a factory is different than child labor as like cutting up vegetables at home or sweeping the floor or just basically helping mom out and, and helping dad out. I used to help my dad with his tax stuff. I did data entry and he'd go through at the end of the day and check all my work, but I'd save him hours of time and he'd hand me 10 bucks and send me to Taco Bell. Spend a lot of time in Taco Bell. Anyways, <laughs> here's some uh, examples. Eight-year-olds can change diapers. I've seen four-year-olds carrying babies, by the way. Um, Ten-year-olds can make a simple meal, like I mentioned before. I used to make my sister ramen, SpaghettiOs, all the hits, all the good stuff. Showed her how to do it as well. I was probably eight or ten years old. Um, Twelve-year-olds can wake up younger siblings for school. So all of a sudden, one of the most stressful things in the world, you know, going out and waking everybody up in the morning and picking up everyone from the bus stop is now done by a 12-year-old, right? And 15-year-olds can drive. Um, learner's permit. 16 years old, they can, like, really drive. Depends on the laws in your area. Uh, and I didn't even say drive a car. They could drive, like, a moped. I had a brother who drove me around on a moped for my after-school activities, right? So I, my brother was helping mom out. She didn't have to drive me around. So let's take a look at some examples. Asian families. Now, we all know the Asian stereotypes because they're true. Asians value education and hard work at all ages. So in Asian families, everybody works. Uh, the moms also tend to work, like the whole housewife thing. It's not really true because you don't really need to have a dedicated housewife if the kids are also maintaining the house. Uh, the family runs their own business typically, so they're financially independent from the rest of the world. They just have to buy things and sell them, right? They need suppliers and customers. That's kind of the two pipes that determine their world, okay? Uh, they're highly social and entrepreneurial. So if you've seen uh, Asian guys, they hustle, they get to know people, they create strong social networks. They're basically Asians reach out. Asians reach out and they find business elsewhere in their community and they really capitalize on it. They do a really good job. They do hard work, typically speaking, uh, and they will forego comfort. So one of the examples that I always use with my dad is I talk about the um, how Asian guys if they're starting out in their life, they'll sleep like six to a room. They'll go to Ikea and buy a bunch of bunk beds. But the the Asian guys are short enough. They can go buy like the, the, the children's bunk beds and save a bunch of money. <laughs> my dad could totally fit in a children's bunk bed. I'm, I'm I joke. I'm, I'm six foot because my dad married a, a, a white lady in America who's six foot tall. Um, and that's my mom. Uh, but <laughs> probably, probably did actually. <laughs> I'll give you, tell you a funny story about my dad in, in another podcast in time. I don't know. Anyways, the Asian families tend to be both tall, like multi-generational, but also wide with like lots of aunts and uncle. Like everyone knows the stereotype of like Uncle Roger, right? Like he's, he bases his character off of the uncle that's always giving you crap because it's true. Like your aunts and uncles are kind of ever present if they live near you. Anyways, above all, they value success and there is not afraid of pressure. They, they'll pressure their children. Asian families kind of make their children grow up fast. Speaking of growing up fast, I love this picture, by the way, because it's kind of it's kind of the Amish in a nutshell. You got the kids out in the field. You got a, a parent or grandparent out here. It's a mix of technology because uh, the Amish aren't anti-technology. They're just very hesitant to adopt new technology for the fear that it will diminish their humanity. Uh, who knew the Amish are actually way, like, way more clued in on the cyberpunk dystopia that we're going to <laughs> than, than we were. They just saw it coming like 200 years in advance. Like, no, we're not getting the chip. We're just going to, we're just going to work in the fields. Uh, but they regulate the adoption of technology because they don't want society to rule their family. They want their family to rule their family. Right. And they, the Amish in particular have a set of bishops. They have an organizing central religious force. Some think it's oppressive. A lot of them don't. Some of them might. I don't know. They keep doing it and they keep growing. So it can't be all bad. And they forego productivity and luxury to maintain a certain pace of life. So all the Amish that I've heard about, talked to, um, they say that the reason why they do this is to maintain a pace of life. That way their whole family is not getting wiped out and shook up by these cycles of technology and economic downturns and, and all this. They, they look at technology and they try to decide what are the net benefits? Like, what are the benefits and what are the costs of adopting this tech? And the Amish were kind of a response originally. 
to the Industrial Revolution, and it's sort of dehumanizing factors. So they came to America. Uh, they're German Anabaptists. I know everyone, when they think about Anabaptists, they think of the, the Dan Carlin um, episode on Munster, uh, I think it was called, in Germany. But the Anabaptists were also the Amish, right? So different, <laughs> different, different spectrum of Anabaptists, <laughs> if you're on the Anabaptist spectrum. Anyways, uh, they do exile disruptive members. Uh, that I do know. Like, they're choosy with their family. So if you grow up Amish and you're disruptive and you're counter, if you're an iconoclast, you're out of there. Uh, it's a controversial thing they do, uh, but it seems to be working for them. I'm not here to comment on the families. I'm just observing. And their community is an extended family. So above all, they keep a certain pace of life and they maintain control of their families by throttling the adoption of new technology. We're going to talk about Hispanic migrants, the USA. Another controversial topic, but I mean, I think the Hispanics have done a great job with their lot in America. Uh, obviously, your mileage will vary, uh, but it seems like they get out what they put in. Uh, they send their men outward. So Asians will establish a base of operations and the Asian, the men will sort of work within that community. Hispanics have a, of a habit of kind of sending their men far, like far off, like almost like adventuring. I don't know if it's the, I don't know if it's the spirit of Hernan Cortez like back, but they'll send their men off and then they'll send money back. Okay. So they, the men are kind of, they shed off. Uh, they eventually will bring the family over. Usually sometimes I think it depends on what they want to do with their family. Um, but they have an extended family back home to take care of their kids. Now sending men off to reap massive benefits without having the added costs, like speaking of sleeping six men to a room, Hispanics will do the same thing. They'll buy a cheap apartment live like men do with like a cardboard box with a TV on it. And that's all their furniture. They're all sleeping on air mattresses. Like if you bring over a family, you then have to absorb all the costs of that locality. But if you just send men, you can like live in a van. <laughs> so you don't have to spend any money, but you get to make all the money. So you'll have a Hispanic people just move to California and make California level wages, send that back to Mexico. Right. And they, they're just living like in a tent. They don't care. It's it's like a it's like a year long camping trip with uh with work, you know, picking vegetables or something. So it, it works as a big net benefit. Their family structure allows the men to be very adventurous. Um Yeah, they, and for that reason they don't even have to worry about specializing. Like they don't have to worry like Asians Asians do about uh you know, education as much. Now I'm not saying that Hispanics are less educated than Asians or anything. I've not even looked into that. There's different types of intelligence, I think, other than academic as well. So I wouldn't even go by test scores or IQ. What I do know is they don't have to worry about going tall with their kids. Um, they can kind of go wide, like, and send them, all, you know, along and make it work. So different strategies, right? So, but all these strategies, despite the fact that they're all so different, uh, they have a couple of similarities. They solidify or enhance the social position of the family. Uh, they use multiple family members as production sources. So it's not just one breadwinner because that is a fragile system, right? Uh, I have an uncle who got injured uh, on the job and they, they just lost their breadwinner and it ruined their family. Like it was not good. Like he, it, it wasn't his fault or anything, but he couldn't recover. Uh, his wife had to work and a lot of resentment grew and the, the family disintegrated and it was a big mess. Um, but everybody works when it comes to a lot of these successful families. They work either for direct profit or they work as training and indoctrination. Like they might just work not because it makes money. Like the kids are there to learn the trade over time and also be part of the lifestyle. It's about the spirit of working, about the habit of working. Like I used to do my math homework in the same room that my dad did his accounting work. And that allowed me to kind of build this habit of, okay, now I'm in this office at home. This is where work happens. This is where we produce. This is where we make money. So that when it comes time for me, like I work home, I work from home now and it's no problem for me. I did not, I've been doing this since 2017 and I don't have any problems with discipline because my dad trained me on how to do that. I never really thought about that until just now, actually. So oh, thanks dad. The guy probably said like a hundred words to me total in my, my entire childhood, but he's done more for me than anybody else. It's, it's crazy. Dads are crazy. Dads are magic. Anyways. <laughs> And they either adapt to or excuse themselves from the cycles of societal prosperity. So the Mexicans, the Hispanics kind of, I mean, because it's more than just Mexicans, the Hispanics kind of go and take advantage of good times, uh, but they don't have to invest. So they don't have to deal with the fallout of bad times as much. 
because it's all just going back to Mexico anyway, or wherever it's going. Sorry. Um, the, the Amish have totally just stepped their lifestyle out of what society provides. So they don't care about the cycles of hard times and good times. It's like, well, you know, they're not buying as much grain. whoop de doo I guess we're not, you know, going to buy as much land this year. We'll just sort of maintain. Um, and the Asian family works very hard and kind of spreads themselves out, but they're always training themselves up so that they, when there's hard times that come, they've sort of strategized on how to avoid it. So like for me, my dad came here, he got his accounting degree and I got my engineering degree. So we're spread out. If he loses his job for some reason, I mean, people always have to count money. So accountants usually stay in business. Um, but if I get laid off or something, he's there to help me. If I, if I get laid off or something, my brother can help me out as well. Like we've spread ourselves out in terms of skills. So we're not affected by the fourth turning, right? We're, we've kind of opted for perpetually hard times. <laughs> like I don't want better times. I don't want to pass on better times to my children. Times are good enough. I don't, cause I don't want them to be ruined by the, the best times, the better times. I want them, I want them to have hard times. I want them to have their own hard times and let that craft them into strong men. And then they pass on, you know, more interesting and newer problems to their kids. Um, more challenges, right? It's not really problems. Every problem is a challenge if you've got a good attitude about it. Anyway, enough of this, enough of this like coach, you know, <laughs> peewee, peewee football coach uh, talk here. But the bottom line is that all successful families have their kernel of value outside of regular society, society, right? They don't depend on society. Their value is not in society. They don't care who wins the next election. Could you imagine how happy you'd be if you didn't care who wins the next election? You could be like me. I don't care. I'm still making money. <laughs> I'm still buying my, it's like, unless one of the president's main platform is to come here and take my sheep, then I don't care. <laughs> that'd be, that'd be great. <laughs> the presidential platform is just F this one guy in particular. I think the, I think the problem is that might unite the nation. Oh, that's depressing. Anyways, my direct advice to you is find like-minded people. That's inside of your family as well. Note that if you're single, this can help you find uh, your husband or wife that you want. Find like-minded people who have the same concerns that you have because people with the same concerns that you have will be interested in the solutions that maybe you come up with. Or they'll make a solution that you follow, right? Create a close-knit of uh, close-knit community of people that you trust. All right. Start with your family. As I said before, start with your family and see if you can get closer with them and see maybe if you can help them out. Get involved. Call them once a week. Uh, you know, be ready to forego material comfort. Maybe if your brother is kind of floundering and wherever he is, he can come in and just move in with you, save himself some rent money, and, and he can now help you fix up the house, save you some handyman money. At the very least, you're helping your brother, right? Isn't that a good thing? Um, share your home, share your resources, take chances on people, see who grows. My dad actually took people in uh, who were in his church. Uh, he took people in and they lived in his house. So talk about a Christian. That guy treated his church members like family and helped them a lot, got them access. They went from like inner city Baltimore to having access to awesome up high end Washington, D.C. suburb um, schools that were really good. Uh, so sorry about that. A family is less of people who just have common bonds and common blood. It's about people who invest and help each other grow. They invest in each other and help each other grow. This means you're going to have to put a lot of social capital into people and you're going to have to extend trust to people. You will be betrayed. People will get lazy. You're just going to take them as they come and see if they're going to help you. But you're not going to get to the good people unless you go through the bad, right? We got to start, start breaking through that kind of Western American a social nature of, hey, I just want to be left alone. If you want to be left alone, you're going to die. Okay. You're going to, you're going to expire. Okay. You're going to unalive. I, I'm sorry, YouTube. But the, the fact is, is that you're going to have to get people that you work with. If you're going to make it through the hard times, people don't survive these things just on their own. Um, they certainly don't flourish. A, fa a traditional family may not be in it for you. You might just not have the equipment, you know, the people, uh, the capital or the know-how to do that. But you can create a family of people that you could be work with, family of people that you know from church, or just people that you get to know just as friends. Like some of the best friends I've ever met were just chance meetings. Um, try a hybrid approach, you know, bring in family members that are like-minded, meet other people, create communities, right? And you want to create a locus of power that's outside of society, right? And it's above any member of your family, your new family, right? 
um, you have some sort of greater, higher purpose or greater, higher um, ruler that keeps everyone together because that's how you mediate disputes. You have to appeal to something greater. You can't just, no one's the king of the family. All right. No matter how much my dad insists he is. All right. That's my advice. Uh, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions, please leave a comment. I'll read every single comment. Promise. Uh, even if it's really mean. Probably especially if it's really mean. Those sometimes get really funny. Please do hit like. Please hit subscribe. I appreciate it. It helps me out. I want to spread this message. I come from a very different background to most Americans. I don't mean to like bash the West, but it does seem like you guys could use some help. So I'm here to just speak my mind. That's why it's called men are speaking. Uh, and go drink some water and stretch. It's never a bad idea to do that. <laughs> Above all, thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.